Welcome to another Talking History with Humphreys and Reid, with me, military historian Paul Reid. And um, me, Dr Victoria Humphreys, author of uh, War Fiction and researcher of war and war trauma. So we're really pleased uh, this time to be joined by Dr Juliet Roberts, who's going to talk to us about the impact of facial injuries and how those facial injuries were recorded in the Great War, something that particularly interests me because I knew two veterans who I interviewed in the early 1990s who both had severe facial injuries from being in combat on the Western Front. Um, and so this is something that I'm really, really looking forward to hearing more about. So, Dr. Roberts, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul and Victoria, for asking me to join you and present you with my uh, studies for my PhD. So I've entitled it Staring Trauma in the Face, Portraits of Injured Soldiers by Henry Tonks and Raphael Frieder. Um, now, facial trauma was not actually unique to the First World War. It's simply the scale uh, was absolutely unprecedented, mainly caused by the industrial nature of the weaponry that was used and essentially by the design of the war theater, and that is to say the trenches. The men's faces were very vulnerable to injury as they moved their heads above the parapet. Um, they had injuries mostly from gunshot, which caused a lot of damage to people's faces, uh, equally exploding artillery, uh, shrapnel injuries, and also burns um, from, from cordite, and pilots in particular were vulnerable to burn injuries from explosions and fires on the airplanes. There were some 60,000 cases of facial injury recorded with uh, English troops, similar in France. Uh, in France, for example, 10 to 14,000 of these men were considered as grand blessé or seriously injured men, serious trauma with lasting effects. Uh, I just wanted to discuss uh, Tonks and Frieder with you because their work is unique. Many of you are probably very familiar with Henry Tonks' work from various historiographies. He's been written about and examined. He's, his work has been exhibited since the mid-1980s. Uh, next slide, Paul, please. So here we have Henry Tonks on the left, photographed by Beresford from 1922. And on the right is Raphael Friday from the 1930s. Tonks was born in 1862. He was, uh, lived in very comfortable circumstances. His father owned a brass foundry in Birmingham and that he was brought up in a large house uh, outside Birmingham at uh, Solihull. He was sent away to school as people were from that kind of social class in those days. He went on to study medicine first at the Royal Sussex County Hospital in Brighton and then on to the London Hospital under the tutelage of Frederick Treves. He trained as a surgeon and then worked at the Royal Free as an anatomist and took night classes in life drawing at the Westminster School of Art under Frederick Brown. Brown eventually became Professor of Fine Art at the Slade and Henry Tonks joined the Slade as an anatomy professor in 1892 and a complete career change from medicine and surgery. Frederick Treves actually said that he thought that Tonks was temperamentally not suited to surgery. And indeed, Tonks often got very distressed at some of the things he had to see and do when he worked as a doctor. And he always had a passion for art. His family were very concerned that he would end up a starving artist in the garret, which is, actually what happened to Frieda. Um, so in 1892, he started his career uh, at the Slade, where he eventually ended up being Professor of Fine Art himself after Brown left. He died in 1937, and his biography was written by his friend Joseph Hone. Now, 1892 was also an important year for Raphael Frieda was when he began his studies at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Lyon, which was a very prestigious, very well-known institution. Freude was born a dean in the south of France in 1877. He was an only child. He had an older sibling that died in infancy. His father was a tailor with the French army, but as his name suggests, he was from Alsace 
and was one of the many people who decided to move to France after the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71. Prider was only 15 when he went to art school in 1892, where he spent seven years. So in actual fact, he had a far more comprehensive training uh, in art and at art school than Henry Tonks, who in fact regretted and said much later in his life that he wished as a teenager he'd had the opportunity to go to art school um, in the same way as, as Frieder had, had done. Frieder won lots of prizes for his work. The basis for their training in art school for both of them, I guess, for, for Tonks for his night classes, and certainly for Frieder was life drawing. And many hours were spent drawing skeletons first, then musculature, and then live models. Um, I think this was the basis for art education well into the 1950s in Western Europe. So it was very important for them to know exactly where things were meant to be and how they were meant to draw bodies and faces and portraits and humans in general. Um, when he finished at art school in 1899, Frieder went to Paris and he initially worked as a designer for um, uh, stained glass for a company called Felix Godin. He was very prolific, drew an awful lot of what they call cartoons, which were designs for these um, um, stained glass images. Um, and then he became an illustrator. He moved to illustration round about 1908 and he also worked as a commercial artist. Um, he illustrated in fact only five uh, books in his lifetime. These were luxury tomes which were exclusive and limited edition of only a few hundred copies of each uh, edition. Uh, his stories that he illustrated were all classical stories. He was what they call a narrative or a historical artist. Uh, although all of his images, just like Tonks, before and after the war, involve people. Neither artist did portraits or uh, did um, landscape or uh, still life or other subject matter. It was always people. Uh, Prida also drew from life. He had a, a, an atelier near where he lived in Paris and he used life models there. Uh, many of them complained about the cold in his atelier because in terms of material wealth, he was actually not very well off at all compared to Tonks' very comfortable uh, living in London. Eventually, Friday, after his fifth illustrated book, faded into obscurity. We don't really know why. We don't have a huge amount of information on him. It's possible that he had problems with the publishers. There is evidence that he had problems with his publishers from time to time. He was very dedicated to his work. He lived in penury in this tiny apartment in Paris with his mother. His father abandoned the family when Friday was a teenager and his mother was very frail all her life. She died in 1922. It's interesting to think about Friday's story and his biography because in actual fact, uh, a French television producer called Jean Frappard bought one of Frieda's prints sometime in the middle of the 20th century and developed this obsession with him and did an awful lot of research and found lots of material on him, collected an awful lot of material and wrote a biography, but it was never published. So um, I managed to get my hands on that biography, luckily to complete my studies. In terms of their wars, uh, Tonks was more or less autonomous. He was 52 when the war broke out. So he couldn't really work as a surgeon because it was quite a long time since he'd worked in medicine, but he really wanted to do his bit for, for the war and initially went to France and helped at a field hospital. There, for example, he produced his saline infusion painting, which I think was at the Imperial War Museum in 1915. And eventually he found himself at Aldershot where Harold Gillies, the renowned plastic surgeon, had set up a maxillofacial unit and then on to Sidcup because Aldershot was too small 
uh, for, for his needs and for, in fact, the, the numbers, the, the huge numbers of men with fatal injury. Um, he lasted about 18 months at uh, Harold Gillies Maxillofacial Unit, and after that, he went to become an official war artist, which, in fact, I think was his ambition throughout the war. He was, he was making an attempt to, to try and, and do more, travel more, um, although he did indeed find creating the medical portraits very, very interesting. He said it was good practice if nothing else, and often said that uh, not didn't give very much in terms of how he interacted with the men when he did their portraits, but would make the occasional comment about one chap who was particularly cheerful, even though his injuries were frightful. He also called it a chamber of horrors. And uh, I guess it was really for somebody like him, but he was medically qualified. So one can only imagine how Frieda felt, even though the narratives were often very violent in the books he illustrated. But to be, come face to face with a real life injured and very badly um, disabled soldier must have been quite something for him. Um, Tonks was also, um, when he joined the army briefly, was, was uh, enrolled as an officer. And in between times he would do some drawing at Aldershot or then at Sidcup, and then go and um, do some teaching at the Slade in London as well. So it was sort of half and half. Frieda had a lot less agency, in fact. Um, he was originally conscripted in 1897 when he was 20, which was practice in France at the time anyway. However, he didn't see military service then because he was considered as physically not really suited to military and active service. He um, is, is noted on his military records as having faiblesse or weakness, which is essentially tied to his physical attributes. He was tall and slim, and his shoulders and ribcage weren't strong enough or big enough. Uh, so he, he, he had to obey orders. Of course, all this physical attribute and worry about his faiblesse became unimportant in 1914, and he was mobilized and joined the 54th Artillery, uh, probably as an infantryman. And um, in August 1916, he joined the auxiliary services. So his details are quite sketchy on his military notes, but it seems that his physicality really didn't, wasn't suitable. He was 37 when the war broke out as well. Um, and sometime between 19, August 1916 and November 1917, we're not quite sure what exactly his function was in, a, as in the auxiliary services. But eventually, in November 1917, he was deployed as a medical orderly at uh, Albert Pons Maxillofacial Unit in Lyon, where he spent the rest of the war. Now, Albert Pons was a dentist and stomatologist, and ran the dental school in Lyon and was one of the first to establish a specific and dedicated maxillofacial unit in France at the outbreak of the war in September 1914. So as early as 1914 it was becoming obvious that facial injury was a major problem and needed to be dealt with. So in, in, a, in the space of months actually in France there were five units uh, for maxillofacial injury set up already and then a further five, I think, were added before the end of the war. Um, Albert Pont wasn't really as talented as, as um, Howell Gillies in terms of surgery. He wasn't a trained surgeon. He was a dentist. So you will see, I mean, some of the images really, um, the reconstruction is very rudimentary. He depended a lot on prosthetics and developed some prosthetics uh, using materials that the men had to sort of refashion themselves every day. Um, it, was a, it was an attempt to help these men rehabilitate, I guess. And he also devised a special little uh, pack or trousseau of um, instruments, uh, wires particularly, to um, stabilize fractures, jaw fractures on the battlefield. The big problem was the amount of time it took before the men actually got to be treated 
So lots of complications had set in by the time they eventually got to the maxillofacial units, particularly in France, this seems to have been a problem. So Paul's idea was to try and stabilize the fractures as much as possible, and then there were less likely to be complications when the men reached the maxillofacial unit. So both of these artists collaborated with surgeons in order to document the surgeon's patient's faces. Honks, you could argue, was tailor-made for the job. He was a, a surgeon, he was used to handling tissue and patients and bodies and all their different uh, iterations. Um, both were well-versed in life drawing, so although Trident didn't necessarily handle flesh in the same way Tonks would have done. I guess if he was a medical orderly, he was used to caring for patients in one capacity or another. He did actually do quite a lot of drawing and art while he was at Lyon. So I, again, I'm not sure how much time he spent on the wards with patients and how much time he spent recording the injuries. So um, we can maybe move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so here we have two examples of the portraits. There are in fact thousands of images of facial trauma from the Great War in existence in various types of media. Hongs and Frieda's work in fact only accounts for a very small part of this. There are lots of photographs, there are lots of plaster casts or moulage which tended to be more used in France than in England. You also find moulage before and after and painted and coloured in um, in France as well. Part of Pont's collection, and he did collect an awful lot of material and had a museum at the maxillofacial unit in, in Lyon, which eventually found its way to the Musée des Hospices Civils in Lyon. Um, and in that there are moulage of some of the men that were drawn by Frida, and also before and after. And again, it was something that the dentists used to make devices for these men, to make false teeth, to make um, uh, braces, etc., to try and uh, repair the damage. What makes these portraits so compelling um, is just that they convey more than the injury. They follow the conventions of a, of a normal portrait. You have a man's face, head. Sometimes you have more details, more times not. And there's a kind of three dimensionality to them that is perhaps absent in some of the watercolors. And again, the watercolors are really good. They do what they're supposed to do. They record the injuries, they record the process of treatment. I'm thinking of Herbert Coe's watercolors, for example, which are part of the Gillies collection as well at the Royal College of Surgeons. So um, there's very much a, a sort of individuality, the, the essence of the sitter comes through in these portraits. Um, their color representation as well, which again with photography was difficult to achieve or not achieved at all. Um, and there's a sensory element to these images as well, which again can kind of be absent in, in other representations, other drawings. You can see how Tonks moved his fingers around the page to mold the person's face. And um, he shapes the, the face with his pastel onto the paper. So there's a very sensory touch is the most important element here, I think, in, in Frieda's image. There's a distance about, uh, sorry, in Tonks's image, there's a distance about Frieda's images, which suggests that his sense was sight. He's extremely observant. Every tiny detail is included in the portrait. Um, again, it's a kind of notion or a sense in Tonks' portrait, but the fine lines are very important for Frieda. Also important to remember that neither artist changed their style or their choice of material to create these portraits. So they were comfortable with the materials they used, which is another reason why these are so compelling and probably contributes towards the success of these portraits, presenting these men and their injuries. Um, on the left, you have Francois Deux, 
who was injured with, by an exploding hand grenade in 1917. And on the right is Bob Davidson, uh, who was injured in 1916. The top part of his lip was, was badly damaged and torn apart. Uh, this is the after portrait. I, as you can see, I did discuss in my thesis how well or not the scarring on these men's faces was represented. And it, it does seem that Henry Tonks kind of downplayed you, by his use of, of pastel the, the extent of the scarring. Because if you look at photographs of these men, even if they're in black and white, the, the scarring is a lot more intense um, in some of the, the, the photographs. Prida signed all his portraits and Tonks didn't, which is also interesting. Again, this is related to the audience that they intended uh, for these images. Um, also, um, I would say that while Tonks presents before and after, and in actual fact, there are only 12 examples of before and after in Tonks portraits. Um, you get what happens in between in uh, Frieda's portraits. There are in fact, 73 of Tonks portraits. Three of them are at UCL Museum and the other 70 are kept at the Gillies archives of the Royal College of Surgeons. Frieda, because he was an illustrator, was used to making several versions of the same image in order that the correct one would eventually be uh, used, useful for, or used for, for um, uh, engraving. Um, what you see in Frieda's portraits, first of all, 12 of the 22 are of the men in full uniform. And you can see some of them are decorated. This chap, uh, François Job, has the Croix de Guerre, for example. And you see his regimental numbers, etc. So there's a commemorative aspect to these images, which isn't really apparent in most of Tonks. Frida does do some simple headshots as well, but, but it is interesting that he concentrates on the uniform. And also the accoutrements of treatment. You can see here on uh, Francois Job, he's got some, a bar in his mouth. And this would be some kind of device, probably to reconstruct his broken jaw, to support it. And equally, it's an old wound. Um, so there's a contracture in the scarring there, which, again, as I said, was caused a lot of problems. So they're, they're trying to stretch the scarring and support the fractures in his mouth. And eventually the reconstruction would happen and these devices would be removed. But there are other images by Frieda with men with frames on their faces and also a man with a nasogastric tube because eating and speaking obviously were two huge problems. And again, I explored the portraits and how they functioned as primary sources. What could they tell us about these men's experience? It's all well and good looking at the portraits and thinking, oh gosh, these injuries were terrible. But you also have to think about how do these men get on with their lives afterwards, let alone endure all the procedures and the pain they had in the hospital. So I thought about things like speech and eating. Speech therapy is interesting because at Val de Grasse in Paris, they did actually start using speech therapy methods to try and help these men. Um, there are some documents that are available online in French, but they are medical um, analysis and there's a, a journal called La Restauration Maxillofaciale, Maxillofacial Re Re Restoration, which was written for all these clinicians who were involved in reconstructing faces. And it has various scenarios in it, I, in, including you know, some of the image, one of the images I found was of a man with burns that Frieda had actually drawn as well. And also um, there was a big Congress, a dental Congress in 1916 by French practitioners. And it wasn't published until 1917, but it's a huge tome of over a thousand pages of various papers recommending certain kinds of treatment, recommending dietary um, regimes, um, recommending 
uh, various other types of devices for repair, and it is mostly dental surgeons. Harold Gillies was at this convention, but he was only an observer at the time. He, he hadn't actually established his unit um, at Aldershot yet at that time. So the French um, practitioners were very good at producing materials and sharing information or trying to share information to help these men. And in Friday's portraits, you will see the various devices, the various means and the various kinds of things that these men had to endure during their treatment. Frida also annotated one or two of his uh, portraits, writing the details of who the sitter is and where their injuries were acquired and what happened. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So here we have two further examples of uh, the portraits. I tried to match the injuries and tried to compare how the artists conveyed the same kind of injury. Now on the left, we have uh, sous Lieutenant Allemand from 1917 when he was injured. Um, it's quite difficult to see really his injury. And again, this commemorative idea that he's wearing a uniform, so we know exactly where he got his injury. Tonks did, uh, did um, portray some of the men in their military hospital uniform of the blue jacket and the red tie. If you weren't familiar with that idea that men wore a special uniform in hospital for the British military, um, I think it'd be difficult to to really see where they got the injuries. It, there could be any number of reasons why. It could be an industrial injury, it could be a car accident. So if you weren't aware, if you didn't have the date of the portrait, which you know, is not on there with Tonks, then you, know, you could be forgiven for thinking that it wasn't a necessarily a military injury. Frida, of course, in no uncertain terms, shows where these men got their injuries and how they got their injuries. They're obviously um, veterans with injured faces. Um, he uses, again, you can see that their palette, their color palettes are quite limited. They don't use many colors. You can see Tonk's tentative movements around Dandridge's head here on the right, where he started to sort of shape the head. Again, the precision of Frida's portrait of Alamo really contrasts with this, but the way his technique um, produces this, I would say the same result in that there's a three-dimensional aspect to these portraits that, that makes them really compelling. Now, in terms of audience, um, an intended audience, uh, Tom Lubbock uh, wrote many years ago, I think it was the late nineties, that really, if you look at Tonks's portraits, they're not terribly accurate. They don't seem to be, that was his argument. They, they don't seem to really show great detail of these wounds, but in actual fact, it was because he knew that the people who were going to be looking at them were surgeons and dentists who were extremely familiar with the anatomy and physiology of the face. So they didn't have to have the exact details. And also they were supported by other images such as x-rays and diagrams as well. Um, I think, you know, he, he, he never meant them to be seen by anyone and he was very bothered by visitors that used to come to Aldershot to his office to see the portraits. He said they're, they're terrible things to see and he wasn't very happy at all. Um, Frida, on the other hand, produced a portfolio called Les Misères de la Guerre and included his portraits of these injured men in it. So it seems like it was his intention to publish these images after the war. Um, I really don't know what happened, but I think they were probably left with Albert Hétan down in Lyon when Frida went back to Paris after the war. Um, um, 
kept all of these images and all the moulage in his own, in his office, and, and they had a little museum. Um, but I think, I don't know why, Marjorie Gerhardt, uh, whose monograph, The Men with Broken Faces, I used, in fact, for my master's, as well as, uh, as a secondary source for my, my PhD, reckons that she, she argues that it was probably to do with pensions, it was probably to do with general fatigue, with injured, seeing injured soldiers, although these men were much more visible in France than they were in England, for sure. In, in, there are many reasons for this, but in England they were kept hidden away, they had blue benches and sid cup to sit on so they wouldn't upset any uh, unsuspecting passerby. But in France, they were really encouraged to go out in public and show what they'd done for their country. So I think this is probably one of the bases for arguing that Frida did in fact want to publish these images. However, um, the, there are two sets of images, one at the uh, Musée de Santé des Armées, at Val de Grasse in Paris, so they're military property, uh, 22, plus uh, some um, preparatory drawings and the cover for this, this portfolio called Misère la Guerre. And then there are 14 copies of some of the same portraits down at the Musée des Hospices Civils in Lyon. Interestingly, the portfolio that is now in possession of the Musée de Santé des Armées was sold and auctioned off in 1961, which is the year after Albert Pont died. So I suspect that some of his belongings, um, while some of them were donated to the museums in Lyon, more of them may well have been sold on. But I didn't get to the bottom of that. I didn't find out why. And in fact, the Musée de Santé des Armées only acquired, uh, bought, um, Frida's collection and portfolio in 2007. So, so in between, I have no idea where these portraits went. And again, you can see the consistency with Thompson's portraits, they all stayed at the um, um, Royal College of Surgeons and luckily survived the Second World War as well because a lot of material was lost during the Second World War. Um, I think maybe we can move on to the next slide. So here we have something common to both artists in that they only each have one example of a colonial soldier in their portraits. There are many reasons for this, um, but here we have um, Raphael Frieda's portrait of Aka Ndie, who was injured at Gallipoli in 1915. And on the right hand side, you have Private Williams from um, the Third Nigerian uh, Regiment, who was injured by gunshot wound in uh, by gunshot in 1917. You can see with Frieda's portrait of Aka and Die that an attempt has been made to repair his face. There are, in fact, he's a little he's a bit of a celebrity. There's a there's a film from 1916, a short film which would have been shown in cinemas of Albert Ripon treating his patients and uh, with some of his colleagues and there are some of the, the men with injured faces there. There are examples of the use of prosthetics. There are examples of the use of bridges and um, uh, braces, etc. cetera. And um, Aka and Diaz, they are doffing his cap to the, the onlookers. And he's not, he, the scarring isn't quite as extensive then. So it's obviously before they attempted to repair his face. There's also a moulage, in fact, of, of uh, this man as well in Lyon. Um, I did look into, there's an, there, I think there, there really is room for a lot more study on colonial soldiers and, and their involvement in, in the First World War. And indeed, the veterans who were injured and disabled afterwards, we know very little about these men and what happened to them after the war. Um, for example, Private Williams, I think, went, went back to Nigeria afterwards. Uh, he had a repair. He had the skin graft to repair the uh, great big gap under, under his, his tongue and his, on his chin. 
Um, the reason why there are so few images of them, one of the reasons might be um, because they weren't necessarily always deployed to the front. There were 600,000 African colonial soldiers, more or less, uh, in the French forces, whereas apparently about 60,000 African colonial soldiers in the British forces. And a lot of these men were deployed in for infrastructural duties, like building railways, et cetera, construction, and auxiliary roads. So they weren't necessarily always deployed to the front. But it is true that um, for, with the French forces, their African colonial soldiers often ended up um, in the Dardanelles. They, that's where they deployed most of them. So, uh, as I said, the, I just found that really interesting, and I think there's a lot more to study here on on these men and what happened to them. Why why aren't there more recordings? What other kind of injuries did they have, etc. Okay, so next slide, please. So they didn't just paint portraits or draw portraits of men with facial injury. There were other war images that they created as well. So on the left, we have Vers la Nuit, which is an engraving. Actually, to me, I, it just, it looks like it could be a vignette from Singer Sargent's Gast, or indeed from Henry Tonk's Advanced Dressing Station on the right. It, it really is very evocative of, of two men, as you can see, they're stumbling in the dark, Verlani towards the dark, and it actually won a, a prize at the Salon des Artistes in 1922. So um, he also, Frida also drew munitions workers in Lyon at the Barre d'Artillerie, and he also illustrated a brochure, which was for a rehabilitation center, re-education center, he drew uh, images of men with prosthetic limbs being retrained as agriculturalists or as um, carpenters and, and various other trades that they would use their prosthetic arms for. Um, so, so it wasn't just portraits, they certainly did do other images as well, create other images um, and create other art for during the war. Next slide, please, Paul. Uh, I wanted just to also cover whether or not the men were, Tonks and Frieda were actually affected by their experiences uh, during the war and their experiences of drawing mutilated men. Um, I don't think Henry Tonks style really changed much at all. Um, you can see here in summer 1908 and in spring days 1928. So there's 20 years between the two images and the subject matter is more or less the same. It's uh, a nice garden, there are flowers, there are girls in nice dresses, very romantic. He was quite influenced by the Impressionists as well, even though he was uh, considered to be a member of the New English Artists Club. But his subject matter is very soft and very romantic and very uncontroversial. If we can move on to the next slide. So here we have some of Raphael's, uh, Raphael Frieda's illustrations. And on the left here, we have uh, scene two, Les Mêmes from Edepoir. And again, it's a violent scene. You can see there's been a murder and it's monochrome with a bit of red. The pose is very dramatic. Most of the poses, in fact, and the people in the, that he illustrates for these stories are very dramatic. Often they're bursting out of the frame, as you can see in the right-hand side. Um, the lines are a bit softer in the 1913 image. And on the right-hand side, you have execution from Octave Mirbeau's Le Jardin des Supplices which is the torture garden. And as you can see, it's much harsher, much more violent, really quite disturbing to look at. And I tried to figure out whether this was because he had been adversely affected by his experiences during the war. It's not unknown. There are plenty of 
artists that did experience the First World War who very much changed their style afterwards, who became more subdued. Um, I'm thinking of Otto Dix, for example, an awful lot of his work after the war was very um, grim, very depressive pictures, images of maimed and mutilated soldiers. Um, so I wondered if this was the case with Le Jardin des Supplices, because they are in fact extremely violent, these images, and some of them were actually not included in the book, but sold separately as a, an extra a piece of extra violence, if you like, um, just for people, for some eyes only, not for everybody, because they were considered a bit too um, strong an image, I suppose, for, for commercial selling. Um, and I don't know, I, the, the problem is that the subject matter itself is very violent. So was he just fulfilling the brief? Was he doing as he was asked to do and draw these extremely violent images? Uh, I don't know. So in any case, he, he did actually win a prize at the Salon des Artistes. He won a gold medal in um, 1928. But after that, he had he was supposed to do another set of illustrations for a book by Edgar Allan Poe, but he was dropped. We don't know why, but he 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 was wasn't commissioned to do that particular um, set of illustrations. So after that, he really just disappeared into obscurity and died in penury. He didn't work very much, I think, during the 1930s the odd drawing here and there. He died um, in, on Christmas Day in 1942 and was buried in a mass grave in Paris and his neighbours actually paid for his funeral because he had nothing. And after he, he died, the neighbours noticed that uh, this, this woman who was a young woman actually and was um, interviewed by uh, Frieda's biographer said that she thinks it was Frieda's model and a couple of men came to the apartment and ransacked it and took away drawings and images and essentially, yes, I think that's probably the fate of a lot of his work. These uh, printed tomes still exist. You can still see them occasionally for sale. Um, and they're quite rare. So, that was really the end of Friday, and I, I don't know, as I said, I, I'm not 100% sure if he was, his drawings reflect how he was affected by the war um, in, in Le Jardin des Supplices, or whether it was simply doing as he was asked and producing these very violent images. Um, and the next slide, please. That's it. I have some, just a list of further reading, if anybody's interested in um, making notes of that. These are just some of the documents I used as secondary sources and also primary source. The Life of Henry Tonks by Joseph Hone, I thought was republished a couple of years ago, but I can't find any evidence of it anywhere. So I'm not sure whether that came to fruition. I was just very, very lucky to be able to get a copy when I was doing my masters, which was also on facial injury and art in the First World War. So there we have it. Thank you very much. That's a fascinating uh, talk. Um, and, and I think, I mean, for me, you know, having uh, Dr. Bamji's on your, your list there with his faces from the front, um, in, I heard the very first talk that he gave on, on that subject in, in the 1980s when yeah. he'd not long discovered the kind of case notes. And I remember seeing, I mean, I remember him saying, these are disturbing images I'm about to yeah. show you. And, I'd never seen anything like it. And the photographs are one level, but I do think you're actually right that the art kind of gives it a completely different perspective. Yes. Which is, yes. is truly fascinating. It is. He's done wonderful work. I mean, he was the one that saved the Gillies archive, which was kept at Sidcup, and um, it was going to be thrown out. I mean... How precious is that? It just, it's amazing, really. That, um, and, and we're very lucky. Um, I sent him my master's thesis and he was very complimentary about it. It was really good. 
And I think, yes, he's, uh, there's, I think Jason Bates' photography in the Great War, I've just reviewed that actually. And it was it's published this week in uh, the cultural, uh, the Journal of Cultural History. Oh, sorry. There are so many different journals, but I, I, I reviewed it and I would absolutely recommend it because again, it kind of moves away from the Gillies and the Sid Cup story. That was another one of the things I'd, I'd examined was, was the exhibiting of Henry Tonk's portraits and Frieda's portraits. And they did, they were in fact exhibited side by side in 2012 at the Pompidou Centre in Metz at an exhibition called 1917. And it's literally down the road from me here. It's not far away, but unfortunately I didn't make it to the exhibition. I managed to find some film footage from YouTube on the curator talking about facial injury and the images. And what is very interesting is as the camera sweeps past the Frieda portraits and the Tonks, you can see how dark the Frieda portraits are and how perhaps they're not, they don't draw the eye as much as Tonks, for sure. If nothing else, it's a lesson in being more observant and being more curious and going and looking at the dark images to see what you can see. Um, the images that I've used for this presentation are digitized and you can see them on um, the uh, Musée des Hospices Civils digital collection. However, again, that was something I, I covered. Sometimes the digitized images aren't quite as good and you have to go and see them. In any case, if you're studying history of art, you have to go and see the art in person. And when I went to see Frieda's portraits in person, I was just blown away. It was as if he'd just put his pen down and left the room five minutes earlier. They're absolutely pristine. They really are in very good condition, as are the set at, at uh, Val de Grasse. But, um, you know, so these images, the Musée des Hospices Civils closed in 2014 and they digitized a large part of the collection, but, you know, sometimes it's just taking a photograph and putting it online. More times, you know, the, the images, for example, Henry Tong's portraits are also visible on online and you can zoom in and out and you can almost see the grain of the paper underneath the pastel. So that makes it a more satisfying experience. But at the same time, one has to see them in, in real life because you get a better idea of the dimensions. And um, when I went to see the Tonks portraits first at the Royal College, they were all hanging up quite high and I'm not particularly tall. So it was quite difficult and it was a completely different experience. I've seen them a few more times in exhibitions, the, the exhibition on portraits from the First World War in 2014 at the National Portrait Gallery and also at um, Aftermath at the um, Tate Britain. And when they're, when they're at eye level, it's a completely different experience again, seeing them. So it's, it's really important, I think, to, to think about that. But I did contact Emma Chambers, who's curator at the Tate Britain, and ask her if she'd heard of Raphael Frieda. And he, you know, he's even in France, he's virtually unknown. I found the catalog for 1917 um, and had a look through it. It's enormous. And 1917 was a bit like aftermath and that there were sort of 1500 exhibits at it, it was huge. And while Henry Tonks um, gets a mention that Emma Chambers actually wrote in the 1917 catalogue about Henry Tonks, Friday's just listed as one of the other exhibitors. There's, there's very little known about him and, and maybe a bit more in, in Lyon. He, his work was exhibited on a more local le um, level in, in Lyon and in fact, I also had contact with a doctor who wrote his medical doctoral thesis on Albert Ricon and Raphael Frieda. So that was another gateway to, to getting information on, on Frieda, um, which was interesting really. So it is interesting to think about how these are exhibited and, and also how they influence artists today as well, because they do. Juliet, thank you for that. It was uh, brilliant. Um, as you know, I kind of touched on Tonks a bit in my thesis. Um, yeah. But one of the things I was going to say, could you say more about 
the mediums the artists use because I um, noticed that you used you showed Tonks's other work i.e not the facial portraits and they were given in oil and yet he used pastels all the time and I, you know was that a deliberate use this kind of it says a medium it's quite transient in the sense you can kind of rub it out you can yeah. kind of you know you can alter the portrait and you and I could alter it if we were to put our hands yeah. on it and is that is there any significance why did he choose that medium um first of all um I think because he really liked working with it he liked oh. the being able to manipulate the colors on page but there's another reason which is probably more pertinent in terms of doing portraits of men with facial injury in a hospital setting they were quick they were quick and easy. An oil paint, you couldn't do an oil painting because it takes weeks to dry. Yes. So oils were, were completely uh, unsuitable for, for recording these, these injuries. So it was the speed at which, and he was well used to using this medium. So it was the speed at which he could recreate. And he did apparently go into the operation theater and do sketches and do some drawings. Um, and I think the ultimate version, the, the, the color version um, was done in pastel because it was quick and easy to do. And, and he, he was very well versed in its use. So it was the convenience more than anything else. Again, with Frida, it was the medium that he was used to using. So, um, and, and it was probably quite quick for him too. He'd been yeah. drawing for many years. He was a very accomplished artist. So they look, they're painstaking and they're, they're detailed, both sets of portraits actually, but you know, it, it's probably a thing that he was very quick and very efficient at, at producing these images. But yes, it was convenience more than anything else, I think for the, the and, and they weren't kept in the patient's notes because of course the pastels, as you say, were very delicate and very easy to, to erase or rub out or damage or whatever. So they were kept in a rotating frame at the Royal College of Surgeons. Now they're in sets of four. Right. Um, in, in all of them are kept in sets of four uh, at the, at the uh, archives at the Royal College. Uh, I don't know where they I know they've reconfigured it and the Hunterian Museum has literally just opened again. So I must try and go there and see. But yeah, so that was, it was convenience really more than anything else. Yeah. And and also you mentioned about, you know, Frieder signed his work. And can we read more into the fact that uh, Tonks didn't? Like, can we, can we argue that that's a sign somehow of perhaps how he regarded his sitter or his patient, the kind of the gravitas he came, gave to them or the respect he gave them or anything like that? Can we read anything into that? I, I don't know. As I said, I think the reason Frida signed his portraits is probably related to the fact that he intended to publish them. Okay. It could be sheer force of habit as well. Yeah. Because all of his engravings have his signature on it often he had to share the limelight with the engravers because he would do design he did he did his own engraving as well but often he would design the image and then it would be engraved by somebody else so you would have to share the space so i think a lot of it was sheer force of habit um with frida and signing it again i just think that henry tonks wasn't expecting to show these images to anybody other than the men who were treating these men with facial injury um, and men and women, I guess you had nurses as well, but, um, you know, I, I think that, that that was probably why he, he, he just didn't see the need because, again, the men would be, they're instantly recognisable as well, mm -hmm. so you don't necessarily need to sign it, say you've done it because, you know, you're trying to figure out who's in the image. Mm -hmm. They were complementary, I think, to the other forms of documentation, such as photography yeah. and x-ray and sketches. And Tonks also did a lot of sketches mm -hmm. uh, for the operations and planning. And it was the only way, really, that the treating clinicians could envisage how they were going to treat these men, because writing about how they were going to go about restoring these men's features and repairing the damage was just too abstract mm 
they had to have something to visualize mm -hmm. either in 3d like the the plaster casts or the portraits and then the before and after photographs as well there's a certain i suppose degree of gratification there too where you can see some horrendous injury and then several treatments later you have someone whose face is more or less put back together again yeah. but i would also say that um you know the 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 portraits don't give the the full story mm. of the psychological and physical and social impact of these injuries. Mm. Um, these men left, went home after years of treatment sometimes, and re-socializing was often very difficult for them. Um, Bob Davison that I showed in one of the images mm. had to eat separately from his family mm. because he was too self-conscious of the noises he made. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, and and the visibility, and I do think that Frida's portraits actually reflect the visibility of these men. They had a lot more support in France because you had the Union des Blessés de la Face, and you had no equivalent really in England. I know you had the British Legion, but you had no equivalent. And the Union des Blessés de la Face supported these men again practically, and and lobbied for decent pensions for them. And also they had specialist convalescent homes where these men could go, their families could go with them. They gave them practical help, like vouchers for special soft food, you know, these various preparations you could get at the pharmacy, like protein drinks, I guess, mm. that we have today. And also they provided them with um, um they 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 provided them with um, masticators to to mash up their food. So that you know they could eat properly. So they, yeah. there were all sorts of things, and they also ran the lottery, so they could um, raise money to to you know provide holidays for the children of these men with facial injury. So so it was a very different scene, really. I know that the camaraderie and the support that the men had in England at um, Sid Cup was tremendous, but I often wonder what happened to them after they left yeah. and. Did they keep in contact with one another? It's very difficult. So many of these men are, are lost, really. Yeah. I, Paul, I had a very interesting exchange with you during my studies because you were talking about a facial prosthesis, which was ceramic, which yeah. I've never heard of. And I just, I, it's fascinating, really very interesting. Yes, it was a, a veteran who'd been wounded on the, on the Somme um, yeah. and was blown up onto the German barbed wire in front of their trenches. Um, and received a severe shrapnel wound to the face yeah. and was eventually recovered and then um, had one of these um, kind of China face plates basically yeah. kind of constructed for him that he wore. And, and he, when I went to see him, his face was, I mean, he was in his, well, his 90s by then, and he, his skin was kind of very pale and silvery almost. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think a lot of how bad it had been how, how bad it had looked was had fa literally faded over time to a de to a degree yes. um and the 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 mask was in a drawer which he kind of opened up and there was this painted face in a drawer um and i think at the time i don't even know whether they've got one now the imperial war museum did not have one and um and when he died i approached his daughter to see if she would donate it to them, but she'd smashed it with a hammer as soon as he was dead because she'd lived with the stigma of a father with with that kind of injury and, and just wanted rid of it. So Yeah, I guess, you know, yeah, you can understand it really. It, it's um it's interesting because I did cover it for my masters, these 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 face masks. And there is a legacy. I mean, people still make face masks. Uh, for situations whereby the face can't be reconstructed, you know, with removal of tumours or whatever. And obviously the materials are a lot more forgiving and they are, some of them are amazing, you know, the, the, they use silicone and they mm. still, the idea of having part of the face attached to a pair of glasses that you put on mm. cover um, where, where the damage is, uh, which is really interesting, I think. But anyway, yes, no, I thought, I thought that was, very interesting indeed at the time.
Philip, sorry, I, I wanted to ask another question, if yeah. I may, and then we'll see if anyone else wants to. I'm sorry to hog the question oh, time. Uh, but no, I just I was really struck by the uh, portraits of Davidson and Job. Um, to me, and I don't know if I'm imagining this, but Davidson's eyes almost look quite teary, and I kind of, and and Job's as well. To me, his face looks as if rather than being uh, look, being looked upon, being viewed, he is in fact the viewer. So his face almost kind of gives off that sense of shock yes. as if he's viewing his own face for the first time, if that makes sense. Um, and I wondered whether or how the sitters felt about sitting for these portraits. Um, did they have much agency in terms of choosing to or not choosing to or does that yeah yes, if that's you could a say very more. good question yeah I am um, uh, I don't think the men really had an awful lot of control over whether or not um they sat for portraits I think they would have been persuaded that this was necessary so that they could track their treatment and track how it was how things were progressing, like the photographs that they had taken, you know, these were sort of sit there, have your photograph taken. Mm -hmm. I think where they did have agency was with the procedures themselves. Right. And a lot of men, and this is also um, cited in Sophie de la Porte, uh, men with um, go cassé, uh, that these men just simply had enough. And the, sometimes the surgeons would say, oh, look, you know, we'd like to do just one more little procedure. And the men would just say, no, sorry, had enough. And um, I think, you know, Walter Ashworth was a patient of Harold Gillies and he moved, he went to Australia briefly or for a few years, I think. And he bumped into Harold Gillies there and Gillies is saying, oh, well, you know, come back and we need to fix something on your nose here. But he politely declined. So I think Yes, you know, they were able to say enough is enough with the procedures, I think. But in terms of recording, and I think especially with the, the, the plaster casts, these were really invasive procedures. And you can imagine somebody with a huge trauma to their face, mm -hmm. open wounds, etc. And then they have these cloths and put on their face and the, um, and the plaster cast. And it must have been extremely uncomfortable for them. Mm -hmm. But I think it was for the for the greater good, you know. I think they probably would have been persuaded that they needed to have these images taken so that they could be seen to to improve. And also, and this is something Jason Bates discusses in in Photography in the Great War, the photographs, particularly, were used by the men. They were given to the men at the end of the war, after the at the end of their treatment to show to other clinicians if they needed any further treatment, so to show what they had done, and also for pensions, right. so that they could show the pensions office, you know, the extent of their injuries and the extent of the damage. Mm. Um, so there was a practical use for these images and, and they bolstered the arguments for, as I said, pensions and further treatment, etc. So. So that was it. But it is interesting you talk about most of the men are sort of staring passively into the distance. Mm -hmm. There are one or two and they're looking straight out. And I did actually write about this, but it, it didn't, the project didn't come to fruition in the end. But um, I called it Portrait of an Angry Man or Not. And it's one of Friday's portraits. And this man's nose has been ripped away and an attempt was made to make a repair and it just didn't work. But he's got this little furrow here and he looks he looks angry and he's looking straight out, straight out, engaging the viewer. But of course, you, you can't do that. You can't impose an emotion on, on a subject in an image. And I argued that our histori historiographical methodologies kind of keep us from being too subjective and maybe take us back from from imposing all sorts of feelings and ideas on, on the subject. But at the same time, any kind of image is effective and often is made to be so. The artist has an, uh, intends to affect 
the person looking at it. So, so in some ways it can't be helped. You, you have this fleeting idea that somebody's angry or sad when you look at them, and particularly as they're staring out at you from the portrait. But you have to uh, and, uh, think about how, yes, you can be affected, but also take it, take it slowly and, and carefully uh, in terms of making up your mind about what the sitter is feeling. So, mm. but yes, the, the, most of them are, and, and they're so expressive. This is the thing. They're just so, um, you know, yes, you, you wonder what's going through their head, actually. As yeah. that's, you just, just wonder, and you wonder, you know, what kind of, normally if someone's having a portrait done, uh, sometimes there's a bit of conversation maybe between the artist and the sitter. Yeah. Or times yeah. not. I suppose it depends yeah. on whether the artist likes pure silence or not. But yeah, it, you know, what went on between them? Did they converse? Did they not? Some of these men couldn't talk anyway. So, you know, it, it's really interesting to think about that. It's, it's also interesting from Tonk's point of view, I think, because he's not just drawing the injury. You could argue, yeah. could you argue? You know, yeah. if you're if you have an injury to the mouth, do we really need to see the eyes and, and the top of yeah. the head? Do we need yeah. to see the whole face in that way? And then that kind of leads me to questions of voyeurism and how voyeuristic are these kind of images? And, you know, if we are looking, particularly now, because we're not medical individuals, yeah. you know, yeah. we're looking at the images of war. Are yeah. we then voyeur? Are, are, is that what we are? Yes. Um. Yeah, I think I often say that Tonks is probably rotating in his grave as we speak mm -hmm. <laughs> because he really didn't want other people to see these. But I think in terms of facial trauma and medical illustration, in a lot of ways, you have to have the whole face mm. because you need to see what the character is and you need to see how the wound affects this person's face. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of the time, sort of the little quirks of expression were lost when these men had these injuries, obviously depending on the extent of their injuries as well. So the raising of an eyebrow or the, the turn of a smile, you know, these were, were gone. Um, but I think with facial injury, I mean, other types of medical illustration, a lot of the time concentrate on one particular area. If it's dermatology or surgery, you know, nowadays, if it's surgery, it, it's during the operation and it's, directly into the area that's being operated on. Um, if it's a skin disorder, it's just part of the leg, for example, where the, the, the lesion is. <clears throat> um, so I think, yeah, I, I think uh, with the facial injuries, it's, it's difficult to just do an isolated drawing of something. Mm. I think for the, the planning of the surgery, they used parts of the face so they would uh, Tonks for example um, <clears throat> and Dara Lindsay who was an Australian illustrator would do a specific part to do with a skin graft or a skin flap or uh, a piece of jaw that was being repaired. I don't know if it's voyeuristic um, maybe now I suppose the curiosity yes I mean there, there, there are lots of arguments and discussions on um, ethics and the use of medical images, for sure. Mm. And it's extremely important. We have to think about these men's descendants mm. and, and think about ourselves. Would we be happy for our grandparents or great grandparents' medical details to be there for all to see? Mm. So there are questions of consent. Equally, you have um, copyright and things being out of copyright after a certain period of time after a person's death, for example, then, um, you know, I think, yeah, it's it's difficult really to, to think about, but so I think we have to be very careful. I also think that, you know, as a researcher as well, when you're looking at these images, if you're traveling or if even if you're in an open plan office, you know, you have to be careful what you have on your screen because yeah. you don't want to, upset people and and I chose the images this evening because you know and some of them are they're, they're hard to look at but there are worse you know there are worse mm. ones and again you have to be very careful really and it's 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 developing all the time I think and you know we can't offset everything 
there are always going to be people upset by something, something yeah. you haven't even thought of, or something that you think isn't particularly offensive or distressing. Mm. But um, yeah, I think it's it's important to to respectfully look at these images and um, think about the fact that these men have living relatives and descendants and. Um, Susanna Birnoff actually wrote an excellent, brilliant article. She was one of my uh, supervisors for my PhD. She wrote an article on um, an image. I, you probably know about Ralph Lumley. He was a pilot and he was very badly burned and he died um, after a, a, a major skin graft was attempted by Harold Gillies. But his face, his head was taken from the internet because the images, his pictures are, are there by um, a gaming company for a game called Bioshock. And there were these sort of zombies in, in the game and his face was used. And Susanna wrote about it and, and, you know, it's the only serious breach of ethics that I've, I've heard of mm. to date, both in France and in England. But she did contact the company and they just said, oh, well, we found it on the net. We were happy to, you know, we just used it because it was a picture on the internet. And they didn't even think that perhaps, you know, this was somebody who, who suffered horrendously. I mean, I still find that image very, very difficult to look at myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is, too, of course, you do get used to looking at images. I have a background as a theatre sister. I worked in burns, plastic surgery and reconstruction. So again, I'm acutely aware that what I might be able to tolerate is definitely not what other people who haven't worked in that environment um, would would be able to cope with. So, so there's that as well. I'm I'm a bit nervous, and I probably still show things that I shouldn't show. I don't know. No, I, know. I know. I know what you're saying, and you're lucky to have had Susanna Birnoff. I privileged her work in my um thesis say lucky you <laughs> yes I know it was brilliant I had um so yeah my my she she was my external and then I had my two supervisors at the University of Luxembourg with Benoit Magellus who's a contemporary European history historian and um Sandra Kamada who is an anthropologist a specialist in the first world war and then my examiners were Sophie Delaporte and Marjorie Gerhardt so I had really a dream team. Yeah, a fantastic team, really perfect fit for the for the subject. Paul, well, should we open questions to others if they've got any? Yes. Um, so if any, I think there's one in chat actually, which I, I uh from Clifford. Uh I didn't yeah, I did not know of the work of uh, Freda and Great Team or about Tonks. So if, if any of our um um our little band of uh people who've joined us tonight. If any of you want to kind of come on and ask a question, please do, Bobby. I just want to say how absolutely fascinating that was. Um, I, I didn't know about Frida either. I knew quite a bit about Henry Tonks. Um, and as a retired nurse, I have huge admiration for your background, um, Juliet. The only bit of theater I did, I absolutely hated, especially, <laughs> especially faces and hands because they're so human yes yeah, yeah. all of this just really re, re this just reinforces how this is um is all about human beings yeah. and i've never i've never really thought about the the reconstruction gillies work and all the rest of it as a as a heart before yes. where this discussion about these these two incredibly talented artists they're works of art as well as medical imagery which I'd never thought of before it's absolutely fascinating so it's not a question really it's just an yeah, awesome thank you thank you yes yes it is it's um I mean medical illustration imagery has come so far um my my thesis was kind of structured in five chapters and in the first chapter I examined the precedent um I was looking into images of facial difference portraits as a precedent to the Great War. And of course, um, everything has a precedent. And I was going to go quite far back in history uh, into inadvertent inclusion of facial difference in 
images such as, for example, Gerland Dio in the 16th century drew a portrait of an old man. Was it the 16th or the 15th? Anyway, this old man had this rhinophyma, which is this deformed uh, problem that you have with your skin and your nose and uh, things like the Habsburg jaw. But Susanna said to me, you know, it's just too much. It's a PhD in itself. So I went through the 19th century, the long 19th century, and found some really interesting materials. And it was essentially tied to the change in um, medical education and more hospital-based uh, practice was was becoming was coming to the fore really and you would have treating clinicians with their patients in the hospital and artists employed to do portraits or any other images from different parts of the body so dramatology for example there are masses of the Welcome Institute there are masses of portraits there of dramatological conditions mostly caused by syphilis, but other conditions as well. And you have the portraits of these people. They're watercolors, um, but they were like patient notes. That was what they had in those days as, as reference material. They were used as teaching materials in the same way that the, the portraits by Tonks and Friday, I guess, were intended as well to be used as pedagogical materials yeah. um, and deployed. Because in fact, Henry, um, Harold Gillies, Plastic Surgery of the Face was published in 1925, and he did use some of Tonk's portraits in that. They were printed in black and white, but again, that's available online. You can, you, I think if you go on to the Gillies collection, which was compiled by Andrew Bamji, and there's a link on that page somewhere to Plastic Surgery of the Face by Harold Gillies. So, um, yeah, and then the Napoleonic Wars, there's some really interesting material from the Napoleonic Wars. Charles Bell, who was the artist and surgeon, and um, again, I cited some of his work, but also there was this amazing book, which was by a French military surgeon and published in 1865, but it was using sketches and drawings of soldiers who were injured in the Napoleonic Wars. And horrific injuries with, you know, they could do nothing for them. They were, they happened at a time when there was no anesthesia. These men were using metal plates maybe to cover their jaws and, and surviving quite a long time with you know, half their face missing. But uh, the surgeon was called Leon Leguest and he collated all these various injuries, military injuries, as a kind of educational um, piece of material for, for military surgeons, military medical personnel. Um, and then, in during the Franco-Prussian War, there were also there's a small album with about 16 images in it of men with facial injury, French soldiers who were injured um, and, and mutilated during the Franco-Prussian War, and they use prosthetics mostly for these men. Again, the surgery wasn't really developed, and I guess the numbers weren't there. It wasn't quite as as um, overwhelming. Uh, in terms of numbers of these men who were injured. So, yeah, it is it is really interesting to think about it. But nowadays, you know, they have, they can see 3D, they have scans, photography, medical photography. I don't know, do people still illustrate? I've seen surgeons drawing on the patient's notes and planning, doing rough sketches of how they're going to approach a particular operation. But I, you know, I haven't worked in theatres for nearly 30 years, so it's a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby, for that one. Uh, Clifford, I don't know if you wanted to uh, say anything. Um, yes, just, just to say thank you, um, Dr. Uh, Roberts, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I also um, remembered um, looking through some of the images in uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Bamji had accumulated, and um, to add that uh, amongst the photographs, uh, which were before and after photographs in the collection at Sitka, uh, were a number that belonged to colonial troops, um, including the Chinese Labour Corps. Yes. Um, and also a couple of troops from India as well. But yeah. I, what I thought was very touching was there were also some letters where the troops talked about 
Um, there's one by a, a Sikh soldier who said he was worried about not being able to find a wife yes. because of his facial injuries and, yes. and that sort of thing. So there are there are some very interesting stories um, of colonial troops and their experiences yes. uh, in the First World War in that collection. And I'm so glad that uh, Dr. Pamji actually secured that collection yes. um, living in, in Bexley Borough myself. I was quite alarmed when I heard that the, the borough was going to get rid of that collection because I knew of its value. Yes. Um, so it's so a fantastic job he did of securing that for, yes. for everybody. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, stuff still keeps coming out of the woodwork. I think, you know, we probably haven't seen all of it yet. Um, I, I think, you know, stories will... will I, I'm intending to write about somebody who actually, I mean, I grew up in the South Island, I grew up in Tipperary, and the nearest town to me is in County Cork, 10 miles away, and I discovered that there was one of Harold Gilley's patients there. He, uh, and this, this is through Twitter as well, which is, is really interesting, and, and this lady is no longer on Twitter, but she was collecting information on... Um, uh, soldiers in County Cork who fought in the First World War. And she came across um, a newspaper article from the early 1960s about this man who lived in Mitchellstown and uh, he died. And um, I just, yeah, I have to do some more investigating, but it's really interesting. And um, he died before I was born, but, you know, to think that I was 10 miles down the road from one of these men <laughs> is really interesting. But uh, I Trump's did a portrait of him as well. So, so I have to do more rooting around there and find some more information on him. I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to sign off. It's uh, half past three in the morning in Hong Kong. <laughs> oh, my word. Oh, <laughs> I, have to, I have to turn in if I'm going oh, to yeah. do anything tomorrow. Oh, good night and good morning. So much. Thank you so much for this <laughs> wonderful you. presentation. Thank you very Goodbye, much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. And I don't know if, Jackie, if you wanted to say anything, uh, you don't have to, but if, if you wanted to, you're more than welcome. Uh, can I say something after the re um, recording has finished? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah so, so well, let's we'll finish the questions then. I mean, yeah. honestly, Julia, I could ask you tons because I'd really love to have a discussion with you about Jonathan Jones and the things that he said about Henry Tonks. I won't now because we could go on and on. There's... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, you have my email address. and I have to ask I'm, you. I'm yeah. extremely happy to take any questions. If you think of anything or make a list of them, anything at all, I'm very, very happy to answer them. So... It's just fascinating. The, the, the fact that we've got, you know, your talk has generated so many questions just goes to show how interesting it is Thank as a you. subject, but also you as a speaker and the life that you're giving it is, is brilliant and fantastic. Mm -hmm. And very, very, feel very privileged that you've come on to our show to talk about this subject with us today. Oh, I'm absolutely honoured, delighted. The um, honour is ours. Thank you yeah. much. The, the honour is indeed ours. So what I'll do is I'll wrap up the recording side of it and then we'll just finish off afterwards. So uh, Dr. Julia Roberts, thank you so much for, for joining us. It's a fascinating subject. I, I mean, I know myself and Victoria both really hope that you do write something on this and publish on it because it's so important. And uh, thanks for a fascinating and engaging talk. Um, uh, and we hope to talk to you again sometime. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you all again on another episode of Talking History with Humphreys and Reid. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.